the Wilds wrote a history of the EE department. Right. And he wrote the radiation lab part of it out of a bad well, memory still, and talking to the wrong yeah, people. Yeah, he's still working on that. Oh, he is. Thank God, because this was all. Well, Carl, I didn't want to tell him. So. Carl uh, did a wonderful he's job. I, my worry about it was that he doesn't have the venom that I have. And, uh, he, you do, Doctor. You do. <laughs> he did. He said, you know, if you corner corner cor cor him on something, especially with DC, our old friend DC Jackson. Yes, but I don't find that. And if he didn't have enough piece of paper, he didn't have any other talent. Well, so happy you happy you brought up Matt Sage because <laughs> yeah. that man had a right. tremendous that's, that's influence on this influence. Influence. And yeah. it's not recognized to this day. Mm. Compton knew it. Yes. Compton oh, uh, was the only man in high places who realized it. <laughs> well, of course, a lot of people, a lot of yes. the contracting offices in Washington happily knew it, too. <laughs> oh, it's kind of a bit strange. To sit he, down he, he was uh, <laughs> the subject of discussion yesterday. Uh, that sage was the subject of discussion yesterday. Yes. All of the, all of the Rowan people were agree emphatically that he was indispensable to the oh, he was. continuing success. Mm -hmm. Nice for all. Is his wife still, still alive? She was a few years. She lived up in the... No, just near, Charlotte uh, died, I think, last year. Last year, I, I thought so. <coughs> she lived for a while up there near us in Vermont. Yes. Yeah. And uh, yeah. that's why she died. Mm -hmm. Let me propose that you uh, launch forth with a uh, response to all that you heard this morning, uh, <laughs> <laughs> as much as you care to respond to that. <laughs> well, and then continue on with the the, the topic of which, which uh, in yeah. the uh, uh, notes was put this way. <laughs> what was it like working with Van Bush? <laughs> <laughs> which is a nice way to put it. <laughs> Fellows on either side of me are just the ones to give you the impression of. <laughs> <laughs> well, Harry, let me pick up uh, and comment upon a few thoughts that came to mind as I listened to this morning's discussion. It seemed now as though I had the very good luck, and I call it luck at MIT, to in a sense have a foot in many camps. Uh, I came here to MIT, as I said yesterday, as a power undergraduate student. I then fell under the influence of Van Bush through my thesis with Harold Edgerton on the differential analyzer. Mm -hmm. I, as a graduate student, <coughs> again, again at the instigation of Bush more than anything else, because he urged me to stay after graduation, instead of going to Westinghouse for my two and a half days work a week, <laughs> and I can almost match Al Hill's story about having two dollars. I was here when all the banks closed. Oh my! Yeah. And had to yeah. Yeah, go through <laughs> with that little experience. But <clears throat> I, I gradually was beginning to realize how narrow my education had been, and many of the weaknesses that Ed and others have enumerated in the electrical engineering program. It was Jay Stratton who taught me my really first understandable course on field theory. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember very clearly taking Ed Bowles' uh, course on oscillators, I think it was, Ed, because you very kindly let me take the final examination a day or two early so I could go down to New York with Harold Edgerton and help him present one of his papers on the stroboscopic uh, response in the machinery. Uh, these things tying <laughs> them together. Now, <clears throat> from then on, I began to find opp opportunity there on the third floor. I went through the uh, detailed association with the network analyzer. That was one category of analog computer. I was aware and familiar with the family of cinema endographs, the differential analyzer leading over into the Rockefeller differential analyzer. I came across the machines that had been developed over in civil engineering for a big mechanical endless tape machine. Oh, the Wilbur machine. The Wilbur machine for getting the roots of a complex oh, yes. uh, yeah. function. Oops. But then 
I also had this rather unusual experience of becoming very closely allied with Draper. And it turned out that Draper may have been partially instrumental because he had very effective contacts with the Spurry Gyroscope Company. Hugh Willis and Preston Bassett were the two people who kept watch on our programs up here in connection with his gyro gun sight work. The servo lab shared space with uh, Draper. We had the rolling platform where he would do all of his studies on gun mounts and moving gyros in space. The servo lab built uh, tun turret drives for Draper for the applications in aeronautics. Well, now, <clears throat> it seems to me not, not much more than a natural event that as we pursued the task of, in those days, putting automatic controls on machines, either guns or aircraft, that had previously been developed and designed in absentia, shall I say, and we'd find the Army would bring up a gun mount and say, now here it is, all grown up, locking worms and everything else that you'd never <coughs> put in a nice uh, uh, powertrain. Now you put a server mechanism on it so that it will do certain <coughs> things. Now we run, we began to run across this in the airborne side with aircraft. The missile bat was one of the first. Um, that was designed, as I said yesterday, by Hugh Dryden. Very high dihedral angle, very stable. Made it almost impossible to maneuver if you were tracking a target. But the strange thing that I'd like to point out here was the digital computer program, as we as we thought of it later, started by Louis de Flores and Nat Sage visiting the Department of Aeronautics and talking to Joe Bicknell and the people over there because they thought this would be allied with the wind tunnel and the wind tunnel would be used as one way of bringing in aerodynamic variables as part of the input to the computer. Well, it was shortly after that, as I remember now, the developments where Vic Nell and those people appeared at the servo lab door one day to talk about the fact that they first of all would need some power drive people. Now from then on, my contacts gradually become more and more related to computers, uh, and I became familiar with the, the ones of uh, the Sperry Gyroscope, the Bell Labs, up to the stage <coughs> where by the, just about at the end of the war, we had reached the phase, and I think it's very important to give Forrester and Everett the credit, they had concluded from their own studies that it was not possible to use the same physical materials to build an analog computer for a simulator that was used in the aircraft because you needed by then get a bandwidth in your instrumentation and in your computer several orders of magnitude wider than the bandwidth. And they were about to declare that this is physically not a viable project. Not in real time. <laughs> not in real time, you see, because all of our previous experience up to that point had exploded the fact that you can change the time scale, as Van Bush did, every time he put a problem on the differential analyzer. And when he was building those ballistic tables, it would take 15 to 20 minutes to go through a trajectory which would be over in two or three seconds in, the, in actual real life. Well, that's where then I first began to realize that, that you came into the picture. Now, from then on, <coughs> I think it's a tribute to the process of MIT, and it's relevant to this story, but I haven't been able to, as I sit here, think it out completely. Because the Servo Mechanisms Laboratory spent its entire time of existence under the clear direction of the Department of Electrical Engineering. Draper was clearly <coughs> under the Department of Aeronautics. So here are these two rather interesting laboratories. Had an internal structure and affiliation with MIT that was quite different from the Radiation Lab. I was teaching every day, as was Draper teaching every day, and using our own, <laughs> our own graduate students. If you talk about inbreeding, I suppose we can be very definitely <laughs> accused of it uh, for the recruiting. But here was Nat Sage, <clears throat> always there as a 
counselor. He would bring us into association with people elsewhere on the campus that we needed to know, would broaden the contacts, and uh, he certainly did play a fantastic role in helping the survival. Few people realize that most of the contracts that were undertaken in the Servo Lab were fixed price contracts. There must have been several hundred of them, totaling more than $10 million yeah, during, during the war. And we managed to, I don't think we ever had more than $50 or $100 overrun until we were building the controls for the Brookhaven nuclear reactor. And there, sort of under protest, we accepted the contract for $400,000. Lyle Borst was the principal director from Brookhaven. And in order to finish the job, we spent just an even million. Well, we somehow we were getting into the state of mind where we had learned that if you're ever going to overspend, make sure that the equipment works. <laughs> now, it turned out that when that first graphite reactor was started up, uh, Mr. Ferguson, uh, what his name, who was the resident manager, and other people down there said, we had no trouble with you, Brown. Yours was the only equipment that worked. And they paid the million dollars without challenge. <laughs> so there, there are, I, learned, I learned that lesson very, very well. But from then on, we learned all about numerical control. We learned about binary algebra. We learned about uh, this and that. And now I can go on from there with Wait a detailed second. questions. Mm -hmm. Two questions about Brookhaven. Radiation lab did that or server mechanism? Server mechanism did that. And that was when and why was it was it digital? Oh no, it wasn't. It was just another project. I mention uh -huh. that because, well, as a matter of fact, it was it, it followed along the same philosophy that Forrester had established for the computer. Reliability had to be one of the most important criteria. And we all waited in awe for our meeting with Edward Teller, who was chairman of the <laughs> Nuclear Energy Reliability Committee. And we passed that successfully when we pointed out to him that we probably had the only fail-safe uh, shutdown system that was then in existence. We, we had no troubles with it. I, I simply mentioned that, Dick, because it was a continuation of the, shall we say, the state of mind uh, <coughs> that we were able to work by. Why don't you follow on, though, with uh, your answer to, how, to what was it like to work with Bush? Well, working with Bush in the days when I remembered him was, was really, to me, an astounding experience. Uh, I'd come here. I only got to know him as a graduate student, really. And my first encounter was when he was criticizing my master's uh, course subject on the history. Every EE student had to write a, a, a report on the history of some area of the field. I'll think of the name of this subject in a moment. Well, when I was making my presentation, a few of the people ridiculed or challenged me when I would use the word tube and not tube. <laughs> and I was still using the British, Australian, Australian. Uh, pronunciation and occasionally a little bit of the spelling. Uh, so I got very much relaxed with Bush. Uh, I had another encounter because there was a time where all research assistants were supposed to submit at the end of the month uh, timesheets, how we spent our time. And I learned my lesson here too, because we all meticulously found out that 37 hours per week was the work week in those days, so we made very sure that we accounted for 37 hours per week. And one day, <coughs> four of us were all summoned down to Bush's office on the second floor, all at once, yeah, we were led, read the riot act. Don't we realize that you'll never get anywhere in the world if you only put in 37 hours of work a week? <laughs> now tell me, what do you really do? <laughs> so, <laughs> the van would come up to that third floor lab <clears throat> and uh, sit like this on the bench and smoke his pipe and just talk at you. And it was the, one of the, the smoothest ways I've ever seen. What year was this, Gordon? This was around about 1933, 34. As early as that. Yes, as early as that. Mm -hmm. I worked for Van on a project when he had the idea that 
you could put a lot of little wires through the end of an oscilloscope tube to put a piece of film on the outside, and the beam would hit the wires on the inside, and you'd expose uh, dots. And I had to go through the process there of learning how you manipulate glass, made up tungsten grids of wires, and that, uh, that project aborted, because at the same time, Mr. Du Dumont, who was then developing the Dumont oscilloscope, came along, and General Radio had one, didn't they, Ed, that yeah. you remember at, at about that time? But Bush, you see, was interested in a wide spectrum of things. Oh, yes. Now then, I, I next began to be aware of him, and this is where things got a little distant, because he preempted one of the younger research assistants who was working with me as an assistant while I was developing the cinema interview, that was John Howard and John Coombs. And it wasn't very long before these people didn't come to the assignments that I thought I had an understanding of. They were always <laughs> in conference with Bush. And uh, all, I began, all I knew was that they were working on some mechanisms having to do with uh, uh, special modes of computation. Now, it was about that time that Hazen had published his papers. I was using his server mechanism in the cinematograph. We demonstrated the automatic curve follower out at the World's Fair in Chicago. These were beginnings of crossing over into the marriage of electronics and, and machinery mm -hmm. in ways that began to pay off only four or five years later. And as I said yesterday, it was the ad, it was the actual act of taking Bush to Washington that pulled him out of the possibility of teaching the server course to the naval officers, and it eventually fell to me. Is that the John Howard who eventually went to ERA? John Howard eventually went to ERA, as did, as did Coombs. And the World's Fair was 1933. 33 no. and 34. Uh, 33 and 34. or 34. Both. Was that Both. special modes of computation related to anything they did during the war later? Say that again, Dick. The work that Howard and Coombs were working on as early as 1933 or 4, was that related to what they did during the war? Uh, I, would, I would dare say probably yes. Could, uh, could Bush have been working on cryptographic machines that early? Well, he was working on the rapid selector that early. Yes. And the rapid selector, in effect, was redirected toward crypto yes. cryptanalysis. I think the roots of, yeah. of what he eventually uh, did in a bigger, in a grandier way had were mm -hmm. in the work that Bill Radford and Bill Overbeck uh, were doing right up there on the third floor of Building 10 and, uh, in the rapid selector field. When, when I came to MIT in 37, and I never met Bush till after the war, he was working on a million things, including right. making artificial diamonds. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know whether he was in charge of the... Uh, uh, what's the, the machine for measuring your heart? Uh, what do you call Electrocardiograph. it? Electrocardiograph. Electrocardiograph. Because one of the projects that I was assigned to up there was to improve, and Warren Horton was involved in Warren Horton, that's Bell Labs. Yes, and we used a fine silicon fiber with gold plated in between two enormous magnets and put the electrodes directly on the chest through these wires to get a recording for an electrocardiogram. Now that led later on, I remember very clearly doing some work in which Norbert Wiener began to become associated, having to do with uh, using magnetic wire and trying to put pulses on magnetic, roll, rolled up magnetic wires. Mm -hmm. But I think at <laughs> that time, I have to be frank and admit, I, I never had a great deal of a, a perspective on where all this was going. I was very much at that stage the student. Mm -hmm. Struggling to pass M36, which is advanced calculus, <laughs> yeah. and a few other things like yeah. that. <laughs> I felt much more at home with a network analyzer. <laughs> well, they've right. now improved the 
electrocardiograph to the point of extinction. I had one about three weeks oh, ago. <laughs> Instead of these metal things with a little Vaseline on the bottom, they now have plastic cups. And the girl said, these don't work on hairy chests. <laughs> and of course, they try to put them on with a vacuum, and the hair just lets the hair in. And the damn things fell off ten times before she managed to get a successful thing. It's like the M17 or whatever the automatic rifle was. It was an elegant device and very inexpensive until they started to improve it. <laughs> but I, I would say, Perry, that the, the, the climate up there on the third floor, as I remember, was one of great intellectual vigor. I remember the records that uh, Cecil Green was there, King Gould was up around there. Uh, there were graduate students reporting to uh, to Bush, uh, to Ernie Gilman. Uh, it, it was quite a, an active place. Yeah. The, the facilities were terribly primitive. <laughs> the instrument room, by what you visualize today, was just ridiculously uh, inadequate. And very soon after that, in comes Arthur von Hippel. Mm. And that began to change. That's when I had to move out. <laughs> the cinema undergraph was moved That's into another area. Hmm? <laughs> he was cleaning up the place, wasn't he? No, he, he, he expected space. He'd yeah. been promised space by Carl Compton. Yeah. So uh, it was my job to provide space for Arthur yeah. Compton. Yours. <laughs> I, so what did I do? I had to give him mine. Well, <laughs> not too bad. No, I'm sorry, the tenth floor, the uh, uh, tenth building, tenth space, um, wasn't preserved as kind of a museum. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Jules, how about you? What was it like to, for you to work with Bush? Uh, I never worked closely as close as these people did. I knew him from the very beginning, and we always had, I say, pleasant talks. And sometimes we just said no, <laughs> but uh, I never had any any very close relationship mm. until really uh, three or four years before he died. Mm. And we used to talk quite often. And we, uh, Twice was on a committee to pick the next president and things of that kind. Mm -hmm. So I knew him, mm -hmm. but I, I can't say that I, I can't tell these these uh, s stories, mm -hmm. anecdotes, mm -hmm. the way uh, uh, Gordon can, and you certainly can. <laughs> well, we'll take a try. But Julius, I want I'd like to prompt you on one thing to the front of it. As I recall it, I'm talking to you about the article that once appeared in the review. Uh, you went to Bush when you came to the Institute, and he threw you into Wiener's course to make up for something. Did he not? Yes. He did. Uh, you were, I think, just but percolating to use a big word. Well, <laughs> the, the trouble, I can't remember just at the moment what the course was, but the situation was, and I skipped over this uh, this morning, I had a year at the University of Washington, as you, I told you, and it was very, very good. They had first class chemistry and good mathematics, and whatever it was. And uh, I was horrified when I got here. I didn't all my credit back. Um, I was admitted to MIT. I got credit for uh, one term. In mechanical drawing, and one year in uh, what we call SATC then, ROTC if you like, and that's all. Mm. <laughs> well, that's what I have to make up. But uh, I'll first tell you about the, the chemistry. This was a exceedingly good course out there. I wasn't given any credit. So I went to uh, uh, Joe Phelan, do you, you remember him? He's a professor of chemistry and uh, told him my story and uh, how angry I was. And he got it. And I said to finally, well, can I take an examination? He said, yes. All right, when is it? Tomorrow morning. <laughs> so I just got off the ship and I studied most of that night. Went in, passed the examination, 
and I waited till I uh, found out uh, that I had passed. I went back to him, and uh, I said, uh, Professor Phelan, I uh, understand that I passed that examination, and therefore will get credit. And he said, yes. And I said, I want to tell you, sir, I'm very, very glad that I took chemistry out of the University of Washington. <laughs> well, that was the situation, and there was one other course, and uh, uh, it was in, uh, I'm not sure whether trigonometry or something. Uh, the fire cry from Wiener's course. It's fire cry from, it was something very, very elementary. I went to Van, and uh, this was the same general situation, and I said, I, uh, I don't want to have to take that course over again. The same thing. I've had it. You know, I but, but you have to make up the. Uh, you have to get the credit. And uh, he said, "Well, uh, all right. Take uh, a winner's course in uh, what was it? Uh, M, for, M something forty-five. I mean, Fourier yeah. series. This is one of the Fourier series for, for analysis. Fourier for analysis. No, hold on. So he took me for that. Integral <laughs> equations. <laughs> 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 Ed, you, you, well, your story uh, must be a fascinating one. I have an idea or two, and I, I, I'd like to beg leave to say a couple of things before that. Uh, there was a story attributed to McLaurin I've always liked. When I came here, physics, as Julius and I have both testified, was virtually non existent in our <laughs> minds. There had been a move to improve teaching of physics year, several years before we came here. And somebody had proposed the name of one uh, William Sutterge Franklin, who came from Lehigh. Of course, that was a low-brow institution compared to the MIT, so the boys in physics were down on, down on it. That was foolish. So they, a delegation of professors or other kinds of animals from the physics department waited on McLaren to complain, the idea of bringing Franklin into the Institute. McLaren listened to them attentively. Finally, they were making, getting nowhere, and the lead man figured he had an ace up his sleeve. He said, the, uh, President McLaren, this man's insane. McLaren just sat back quietly and said, you know, I think we could stand a little insanity on that faculty. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to say one more thing to try to add a little levity along the line. One of my jobs here was to try to get money in those days to support a staff and get it from the government, get it any way I could. And when Colonel Green came along as a possible benefactor, uh, as I told you, I was given a job of watching over him and trying to swindle him out of funds. <clears throat> and he was a, a toughie, and uh, you knew he had worlds of money, but how to extract it. By that time, he had a wooden leg, and that uh, and the index, when I'd go to him each year to ask for money for the next year, he had a little electric cart down there at Nonquit, and he'd run along the beaches with it and have his stamp collection there or his coin collection or something else and fiddle around. Sometimes he'd have diamonds that somebody was trying to hawk to get money for a loan. The, it was always a pretty tender problem, I mean, it, for a young one to go down there and approach this fellow. It wasn't easy for me, and yet our before we got money from the government, we'd leaned on that money from Colonel Green. On this particular occasion, well, one thing, my index, I had to have some measure, and his wooden leg was in, inert, but he, the other one would be crossed and would go up and down, and that's where I first got interested in amplitude distortion. Uh, the amount of money you asked for. When you started with a large sum of money, that amplitude <laughs> was like this. And as you got down and traded with him, and it amplitude would go down. And once he decided how much money he was going to give, that leg would just drop in there and sit right there. But it, it wasn't an interesting procedure. And invariably, every year, you could follow uh, that pattern. But 
the thing I really wanted to get to, uh, naturally, when you're supposed to be a, a money getter of that sort, uh, and a country boy at that, you had to be pretty careful to feel that you had the man in the right mood and that you didn't do anything that would offend him. Well, he had this electric automobile specially built. It's just a little car, like, almost like a, the old autos, electric autos that the girls or women used in the city in 1904. Little lever and all sorts of instruments up here. Uh, he didn't have to use his feet at all, switches and whatnot. I was down there one day and uh, my, Mrs. Bowles was with me and our boy, oldest, our son, Edmund, at top. And after I got through the amenities of trying to get a little money, I asked if I could bring Mrs. Bowles over to introduce her. Oh, sure, bring your ear over. So she went over with the boy, and I went over with him, introduced them. And of course, when it came to introducing the kid, he didn't respond as mother wanted him to. <laughs> and she tried to explain it. When mothers try to explain things with respect to their children, they generally get into trouble. <laughs> oh, she said, uh, Colonel Green, he's like his father. He's interested in all the electrical instruments on that board. <laughs> she thought she'd got through in great shape. There was a long hesitation, and the colonel said nothing. Finally, he leaned up to his mother and said, Mama, where's his wooden leg? <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I didn't mention when we were on the radiation lab and at the beginnings, coming back to Loomis, the problem at the start was how do you man this laboratory? And Loomis, I think, had a great idea. He decided the nuclear boys had nothing to do. This is paradoxical, of course, but at that time it was a fact. It was true. And so he put Ernest Lawrence on the microwave committee. And then Ernest picked Lee Dubridge as the chairman, the uh, direct the group. And that brought in the Robbies and the Ridenauers and uh, the um, Alvarez's and uh, Oh, I can't name all of them, Macmillan and any number yeah. of the brilliant minds in the nuclear field. And that was a liberal dose from Harvard and from Columbia, including Robbie from Columbia. But it was a beautiful idea of bringing together the best of the talent. And they were, curiously enough, at that time unoccupied, relatively speaking. And then later, as that nucleus built itself out, quite uh, under favorable auspices when it came to selection because these boys knew where the able, other able men were hidden in closets. And then later, as the, as the Manhattan Project developed, or the Los Alamos, then they bled off uh, one after another. And in the meantime, as Al has said, the staff had been building at such a rapid rate that you could take two or three people out or six people and not know the, yeah. know the difference. Mm -hmm. But it, it was a... a, a an idea that for which I think Loomis deserved great credit. Uh, he had been helping Ernest on the cyclotron before that, uh, getting the steel for that uh, first big cyclotron. And uh, there was a, an empathy between uh, uh, Lawrence and uh, Loomis. It was uh, very productive at that point, very. Another thing, now we were talking about Van Bush, uh, but I'm going to get on to another side, and Julius can help me out on this. When we came here to the Institute, there was an, of course, an electrochemical engineering, I believe. Mm -hmm. And the man who headed it, was it uh, Goodwin was the top dog, but D.K. Thompson. Yep. And for reasons I don't understand, maybe Julius can explain it. Out of there came Bellarta and several others. And how they happened to start took that course at the institute, I don't know. No, I don't know either. Puzzle, puzzle. Yeah. I haven't dug into that it. That was course 14. Something of that yeah. sort, yes. There was metallurgy, mining and metallurgy was another course that was uh, went out. No, only the mining went out. I beg your pardon, you're right. You're right. Thanks. But I'll tell you, I got associated 
Well, the board of the P.R. Mallory Company, which has since been swallowed up by Dart and then Kraft, and uh, their great contribution was mercury batteries and mm, alkaline right. batteries and so on. And ever since I saw what was going on in the battery place, I wondered why in the hell MIT ever dropped electrochemistry. It's a this puzzle. This is a fallow field now. Yeah. Mm. And batteries are getting more and more mm. important. Exactly. Absolutely. And uh, <clears throat> not be better and better. The there are some very good people in industry who have done some excellent work, but there's very little in the in academia. There's none that I know of. But there must be some, but I don't know. <clears throat> well, I just want to come over to Bush. Uh, I cannot add much to what Gordon has said, but I can give you perhaps an idea or two that can be tacked on to the reputation of the man and his methods. When I took the two courses here, 1920, the fall of 20 and the spring of 21, the one with Bush and the one with Kenley, it was a kind of a comical situation. They needed a laboratory section for each of these courses. Bush wanted one and so did Kennelly. And I got, I was a half-time teacher and I learned what a half-time mean, meant on the staff here in those days. <laughs> uh, I was to run the laboratory. Here I'm taking a course and running a laboratory. And, it, it, and to me as a youngster from out there at Washington University out in the middle of the country, I had never seen anything like that. And, uh, Have you ever seen this tie? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> it's his old school tie. And there were all you could do is go, go around and find the remains and pull it, pull the gadgets together because we had a Tinsley Drysdale potentiometer, which was a beautiful piece of furniture, from which <laughs> you could get a rotating, uh, from a rotating field, you could get a vector. At any angle and bell, like the like the old DC type K potentiometer, you could crank in a, a voltage and angle and measure voltages all along a line. And in those days, we were the up the third floor that Gordon talks about was replete with artificial lines. Yes, that yes, was beautiful yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. Kennelly uh, and had, Fred Dellenbach. Well, that's right. Dellenbach. And Kennelly was a, had been a, a it was a, a sort of a, a fetish with him. The DC lines and AC lines, and the AC line was something like a quarter wave length of 60 cycles, I believe, and they, they simulated a power line. That's right. That's right. The one right over here in the in the uh, building, we we were doing work, and they had the whole power line set up there. It was, it was analog, if you will. That's right. And uh, on this cycles, that's 3,000 miles. Well, a quarter way, but 650 miles is the oh, figure sorry. that I this remember. Is a, this so, thing was yeah. a brutal affair. <laughs> and D.C. Jackson's son had the temerity, not simply to get a degree at Harvard, but to come to MIT and uh, <clears throat> take, a, I believe it was graduate work he took, but anyway. I, in this lab, uh, he was supposed to measure the voltage in, the, in Dellenbaugh's lab. They had a, a D.C., a, a, a an AC electrostatic galvanometer, or, or voltage, a voltmeter. And it was good for up to 100 volts or so. And young DC goes to the end of the line, <laughs> plugs this thing in. And it was a pie section line with condensers at the end. So he took the full charge of, before we got through. Everything, he was everything but burned up and scared to half to death. And he almost lost his Harvard degree. But it, uh, it was illustrative of the poor guy. He was always in trouble. And uh, here we took pride in it because he was the son of the eminent D.C. Jackson, but he was no, he was no reflection of the father. <laughs> but I want to come back to Bush. I nat naturally had an intimate association with him and admired him tremendously, and I was also, I guess, one of his worst critics. <laughs> and um, we won't go into that history, but someday I will try to write about it a little bit. But we we had our difficulties, and I once had a meeting with him, because when he went up to become the vice president, and, uh, let's see, he was dean, executive vice president or something like that, and dean. And, dean. and he knew that I had been critical of him in some ways, and uh, 
Compton had called me in. This is telling tales, but we ought to no, it's add some variety to this show. <laughs> um, Compton called me in for reasons I'll never know, but it was a nice gesture, and told me of the potential move of bringing Bush up. And I, uh, he, want, he asked my, not an opinion, but uh, in a way I was bound to have to say something in my own way. And I said, I had nothing but a world of respect for Bush and not one damn bit of use for his methods. <laughs> Ability, I guess I used. And damned if Compton didn't go to Bush and tell him that. <laughs> yes. Talk about feedback. <laughs> yeah, that was it. I got a telephone call. We know that. <laughs> I got a telephone call from one Van Bush. Ed, can you come up to the office? Yeah. And of course, I was like the bad boy about to be punished. I knew I was going to get hell. <laughs> and Jackson had told me that if I ever got into a fight with Bush, he's going to throw me out of the department. That was Jackson's view, to save the department. And uh, so I was to become salvage. When I went up to see Bush, he wanted to know why I made the statement to Compton. So that may gave me a measure of the communication between Compton and Bush. It was instantaneous. It was a fair question, and I, he said, I can tell you exactly what you said. You said you uh, had nothing but admiration for my ability and not one damn bit of use for my methods. I, Van, you made one mistake, or I will make one correction. I said, not one damn bit of use for your methods. So that's the way we started. <laughs> we got along about 35 minutes or so, and I'm not religious and I'm not superstitious, but it was if I had a a storage system up here that had all the information ready for me, one by one, and I worked him over. I told him about Jackson saying he'd fire me if I ever got into trouble with him. I told him I'd open up and tell him what I thought, felt, and why, provided he would lo not lose his temper, which was a dangerous statement to make Vannevar Bush. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, uh, 35 or 40 minutes, he called his secretary in and asked her to cancel appointments for the rest of the afternoon. Oh, so there I was, closeted with his eminence <laughs> for the rest of the afternoon. Hmm. I won't go into detail here, but to tell you that I didn't get fired, he didn't lose his temper, and I like to believe uh, it was good for both of us. Very good. And the end result of this, I brag a little bit now, was that when I was in Washington, whenever Van was in a little difficulty with the military, I'm the one he'd get a hold of, and we'd have a party <laughs> and try to figure out yeah. something to save the day because That's I did right. admire the man. Oh, and uh, he did get into trouble with uh, not just Admiral Bowen, <laughs> but uh, the, the thing came to a climax in a rather interesting way. The time came after the war to build a Department of Defense. And there were several people who hoped they might be picked for it. Oh, One of them was Carl Compton. Mm -hmm. Another one was Vannevar Bush. Uh, I think the belief was that a man with technical background or a scientist would be useful to get into this rat race. And, and uh, you people who have known Carl Compton know his sincerity, and you also know Bush's ambition. Well, he comes crawling over to my office. Now, this is a bad way to put it, but it's, it's the right way to decorate it. <laughs> and he said, Ed, if I am made sec uh, Secretary of the Air of Defense, would you be Secretary of the Air Force? <laughs> yeah. So this is just to tell you that things got smoothed over yeah. fairly well. And yeah. man was a person you could operate with, and it took a, a frankness. That's right. And uh, outspokenness, and I, I'm proud of the notes I have of his course. They'll go down in history in the Library of Congress. They're pretty detailed of, of, of his course. And incidentally, it was Van who broke over, as I said, into Heaviside, mm -hmm. among other things. Mm -hmm. he, uh, my only complaint there was that he just touched base with Heaviside. Mm -hmm. uh, the book he wrote on Heaviside was largely of Manuel Vargas' work. Mm -hmm. It was made available to Van. Are you referring to the Operational Calculus? I beg your pardon? The Operational uh, Calculus yeah. book? Yes. Yeah. With yeah. Wiener's yeah. appendix. I, um, 
I don't think I'm I'm about run dry here at the, at the moment. Uh, the uh, remarking in the in the uh, lect uh, salad period a while ago. Uh, it's a kind of a rhetorical question as to how one will abstract meetings of this sort or if there's any plan for it where you get a group a large body of this way it's really making a history for MIT but having done a little work in the library myself it takes a lot of time to go over a lot of material and uh, uh, are there plans to uh, write the kind of an abstract you might like to have it ahead of a technical paper so you have some sense of the the substance that's available if you go digging deeply into the uh, prose. There are plans, but there's nothing absolutely definite except to... I beg your pardon? Yeah, well, I, I have plans that others do to use this material. Um, we have nothing firm other than to take a couple of hours of the close to 100 we're going to have and just show people what we've, what we've mm -hmm. collected. It won't be well edited, it won't be smooth. Uh, I hope to use a lot of the textual material on the, book, uh -huh. on the computer. So there's a little bit you, of abstracting. It's my feeling you can do a very good job, but the cutting process is a tough one. Now, since I feel destined to become the face on the cutting room floor, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to get in it. Just one anecdote about Bush. Which <laughs> when Alan Waterman retired and said of ONR, they gave a big dinner for him in Washington. The band was the principal speaker. Now, during the war, we invented the phrase NIH, which meant not invented here. And you knew it was useless to go to some people unless you first convinced them that they invented what it was you wanted to sell them. Well, Bush knew that, but he evidently didn't know of the existence of the National Institutes of Health, and that the director of said institute was right next to him at the head of the table, Jim Shannon. So Bush gives a speech and damns NIH, nothing but NIH, all over the place. And I'm sure most people there thought he was talking about Shannon's institute. Nobody ever corrected him. Oh my. But that amused me so much. <laughs> Uh, I can make a brief remark uh, in response to uh, Mr. Bowles' question. Uh, the the uh, Sloan grant does not provide for any uh, particular use of this material. It is to preserve it archivally, and nothing will go on the on the cutting room floor. The uh, the entire all the tape will be there in the archive. Right now, uh, there are lots of uses, yeah. and various people are undoubtedly going to want to take. Pieces well, for particular purposes, including yeah. the one you suggested, MIT the, history. I'll tell you what, remind, what reminded me of it. It seems to me that if you could cut this material to two or three or four one-hour pieces yes, that's exactly. on different subjects, exactly. then it could be a very valuable educational tool. While in its entirety, nobody's going to sit down and look at it. That's right. Nobody who isn't writing a doctor's thesis. thesis. Uh, After all, when we, we built the new building at Radiation Lab, uh, new, new, I said, Draper Lab, I said, here is a lab that did the most precise work ever known to man in the basement of an old shoe polish factory on Albany Street. And this building has a history. And by God, I'm going to make a movie of it. So I went to Ricky Leacock and told him what the problem was. He said, I think I can do something. Let me think about it. I didn't see Ricky again until I saw his final piece, which was about 25 minutes. And he started out by showing the mailman delivering mail. And then he followed him around and would go into offices and talk to people like Draper or Bill Bodich or a number of others. And uh, I think it's a hell of a good movie, sort of historical of the Draper Lab, but also bringing out the awfulness of that rabbit warren they worked in. And um, I think something of this sort could have great value. 
much greater than ours, which is too parochial. And here you've got a global sort of setting. Right. And uh, I urge you to make some, some, yeah. something or another. Well, we're not making a movie. That's not the purpose. I but but uh, we we did hope to do exactly what you talked about. Take yeah. several pieces on different subjects. <laughs> Uh, lasting anywhere from half an hour to, to two hours. Yeah, right. And uh, pull them out through the whole thing. But that's no, I'm the delighted. It's, it's, it's because so much of what we said is just personal anecdotes uh, without any effort to... Yeah, but you can cut those clever Yes, things. sure. Yes. Oh, yes. We all rambled. I listened to all of you, <laughs> including myself. Oh, sure. And we rambled. You know, really? Good yeah. cutoff places. That's right. Let me get back to Bush. Uh, and ask a question. One of the uh, recurrent comments you get about Bush, which didn't come up in this discussion, was uh, his intense feeling about uh, analog versus digital uh, methods. And I wonder if uh, if there isn't anything you can tell us about this. Why or how did it express itself? Or what did he really think was going to be digital or not? I, I have no idea what Van felt about digital computation. Uh, I can respond to that this way, that I think the, <coughs> the statements of the type that you just uh, expressed are, are just not correct. Um, the 1936 article, Instrumental Analysis, uh, speaks very respectably, respectfully of punch cards and projects the automation of punch card installations and operations. Uh, such automation as uh, realization of Babbage's dream. Yes. And he was thoroughly familiar with Babbage's work, uh, with early digital work. Yeah, and that article is quite uh, impartial as between analog and digital. And uh, beyond that, many of the people who uh, express themselves that way uh, don't realize what the war did to Bush's interest in computers. <laughs> and nobody does, as far as I know. And I wanted to put the question to you that. Uh, Bush did in 1936 uh, project automated computing systems of the types of Babbage originally envisioned. In 1937, he projected their being rendered or realized in electronics and uh, pr proposed photographic storage and random <coughs> magnetic storage, random access storage. Uh, the proposals concerning digital wound up uh, in a memo written in 1940, which is contained here in this collection that I have which is a very enthusiastic account of uh, the uh, working out of electronic digital computing and extending what Radford had done uh, to a full machine mm -hmm. as opposed to limited computing. Well, now, didn't he and, and Norbert Wiener differ a bit? Well, not on this subject, I don't believe. He and Norbert had some kind of about the binary system. Well, it's not so much... Application <clears throat> of it. Bush's, Bush's writings are in terms of decimal, that's right. I beg your pardon. Bush's writings, proposals were in terms of decimal yeah. machines. Decimal. Yeah. Decimal, decimal machine. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until a little bit later that binary came on the scene in a prominent way. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't tell you what uh, Wiener's proposals were. They were never sufficiently definite mm -hmm. to me. Well, you can always go from binary to decimal. That's right. It just takes some hard words. In. So, I, uh, uh, Ethel, I think that uh, that's based on a. a um, Misconception to some large extent. <laughs> but it is the case that when the war ended, Bush did have his Memex article published in, in, in July of 1945, and he did retain his enthusiasm for the Memex concept. And in Science is, uh, is Not Enough, he did have the chapter Memex Revisited, which was a kind of a uh, retreat from the original proposal, but not in the essentials of the original proposal. But it is apparently the case that Bush disowned the post-war computer development efforts. Yeah. And right. if you can shed any light on that, I'd be grateful from your conversations. No, I don't believe I can. I wish I could. Uh, never know. <laughs> I can only, well, I can only add this. That the question has come up to me from two rather strange <coughs> independent sources. One, Christopher Evans from the British... Mm. Uh, activities when they interviewed me and Hazen, they raised this question. And I was a little puzzled because, as a matter of fact, it was the first time that I'd ever been asked to address it. The most recent was only 18 months ago because there's a young man, a very bright young fellow, doing his doctorate thesis down at Yale in the history department 
and his doctorate thesis is to try and document a history of uh, Neva Bush. Where he particularly asked me to uh, associate him with people who knew him personally. Mm-hmm. And I've mentioned yeah, your name, you may have actually mentioned the people at Merck and, and that group. And they, they noticed. Now, in his discussions with me after the war, there was one remark that puzzled me. And I have, it's been nagging me in a way. We were talking about the cinema phonograph. And it was a time when Whirlwind was pretty much, shall I say, to go public and go on the air in a full blown way. And Van left me with a feeling that he was defensive because he said, You know, Gordon, they never gave the cinema phonograph and the differential analyzer a fair chance. That's interesting. That's what he said. And those, those words, well, that may be, you know, my putting into words now, but the impression has stayed with me that he had some regrets, uh, that he, he felt his other machines, which, of course, when I knew him, they were his first love. Oh, yes, of course. And uh, I, I admired them, and I was in there with him, pitching on both feet. And I didn't realize myself that it was when you put a human being in the control loop that those machines ran out of gas. <laughs> and I saw that with uh, the aircraft simulator, mm-hmm. with the process control work that we were doing. And Ed brought it up independently this morning about the Douglas and wrapping an aircraft around the radar. And we all have uh, attachments. To yeah, the, the, whole, the whole thing. Um, I and brought it. a long, long slide rule when I was a freshman. <laughs> 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 and whenever I, I now have an HP 35 that can oh. do all of the same things and more and faster. But if I want to compute out Planck's equation, for instance, <laughs> my inclination is to pick up the log log yeah. slide rule and a piece of paper and a pencil, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, uh, well, I right. am used yeah. to it, I'm comfortable yeah. with it. Well, I also yeah. developed the philosophy, if you I think it's pertinent to this. That as a person gets along in life, it's extremely difficult for him to unlearn what he has grown up with and switch over and uh, latch fully onto some of the new concepts. And this is right. well, well, part I, of my, life. Hmm? My point is this. I would advise any student, you know, what he should do. But I'll go back to what I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to say a few words about my um, involvements or... Uh, in a sense, non-involvement situation. I trailed in his wake, I'll put it all through I the years. I trailed Trail. in his wake. Yes. He yes. was yes. Uh, always moving ahead of me. Yeah. Um, Bush. But I arrived as a freshman uh, in 1935, and uh, there was a joint session of English classes. Uh, and Bush made a presentation on patent, uh, <coughs> writing, writing patent specifications. Uh, and the subject was the Silson Ranch. And this was an introduction to the subject. We were to write our own patent specifications. And it's still one of the very memorable experiences of my life. <laughs> we're sitting there in his characteristic pose, pipe, and explaining the structure of patent specifications and making the distinction between function, specifications of function, and specifications of structure, and uh, going on into some very interesting ramifications of patents. And I'll never forget it. And it apparently has had a lasting effect on me. <laughs> so I always had a very fond memory of Bush. And it's my distinct recollection, uh, when I was in my undergraduate years, that uh, he was uh, an electric force <laughs> in uh, the atmosphere at the Institute. No oh, no about question it. about that. No question about charged. it. Charged, yeah. yeah. He really charged up the place. <laughs> <laughs> well, something had to charge up the Department of Electrical Engineering <laughs> in that early period. Yeah, don't is, forget physics, sir. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, we well that. <laughs> that was what I was thinking of. The, the they were lovable people. You take Ralph Lawrence, yeah, and Pop and Laws. Pop Laws. God, you couldn't find yes. any more lovable people. And by the way, I will make this remark. When I left Washington University, Langsdorf said, be sure to take a course under Professor Laws. <laughs> so when I came with my sheet of paper that long, you know, to get stuff signed off, I go in and see Pop Laws. And of course, here's this fierce mustache guy, and he looked, he looked fierce to me as a kid. 
I told him that I, it had been recommended that I take a course mm -hmm. for him. I was trying to outline my graduate mm -hmm. courses. The, uh, he looked at me and I just shrank. And he said, are you a good manipulator? <laughs> and that was a $64 question because if I said I was a damn good manipulator, he'd say, you ass, I don't want you. And if I'd said I wasn't worth a damn, I'd go. <laughs> so I stood there mute. And I never did take a course, but became very, we became very close friends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I always felt sorry for Pop later because he got to worrying about that damn book and rewriting it. Yeah. And finally, he just went pretty near crazy mm -hmm. over that. But he and his wife were a, a lovable pair mm -hmm. uh, here at, at MIT. Mm -hmm. That was a big force I got. Mm -hmm. We got our first invitation to go out to, um, not Salem, but uh, we lived up the North Shore. I guess it was Salem, that's right. Uh, have lunch with them on Sunday or dinner. And that was a big thing for a youngster at MIT. Mm -hmm. And then I ran, ran into Ralph Lawrence. One time he was going into the sacred toilet across from the Department of Electrical Engineering. He had a key, I didn't. <laughs> and as we came to the door, it was about five in the evening, and uh, he somehow broke down. Uh, the stress and strain always seemed to disappear. And he said, uh, you're doing anything tonight. <laughs> well, it was a funny place to make a date. <laughs> anyway, he said, I'm going up to Harvard to listen to talk on photography. Would you like to go with me? Well, that was a break there. And uh, all the way through, uh, we haven't said much about this, but there was an atmosphere here uh, that was, it really got the got you to thinking about the department as a as a spectacle. I went we went over to the Jacksons. The Jackson had the parties on. That's right. And old Jackson had um, he wore this tuxedo and his shirt. Same shirt for how many years? I don't know, since nineteen seven when he came east. <laughs> and I got I was sitting there at his right and the Lois was on the other side somehow. And every time the old man bent the starched front would crack you know, oil can like a Spencer thermostat. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got to examining him closely. And long since it had been starched and pressed so many times that the bosom was separated from the cloth and the popped open. And there was this hairy chest you were talking about. And uh, oblivious to it, the old man absolutely lost in conversation, you know, to hell with it. Shirt, dress shirt. <laughs> And I also remember the other thing with him when um, uh, our first youngster was coming along and I thought it was in order to make a confession to the old man as a kind of a foster father. Bulls tell you the same thing um, the doctor told Maud and me when our first child was coming. Just keep him warm, full, and dry. <laughs> so that was the edict from the old gentleman Very good. at that time. But there was a warmth to these characters, every one of them. Yeah. 